committee, how do you see, uh, could it lead to some price correction and uh, order thoughts on that? No, so I think uh, <clears throat> commercial lines in general has, has been uh, also one of the segments which have been competitive over the years. Uh, and if you recollect, uh, almost about three years back, reinsurers have stepped in and said that in case if you want to avail uh, reinsurance capacity, given that it's a high exposure segment, you have to price it at a particular level of pricing. Um, so since then, in the in those next two years, if you had seen from an ICSO Lombard standpoint, we had kind of grown faster than the market. Uh, but that's how we see this opportunity for growth. Whenever the market corrects on price, then the focus shifts to service. And relatively, we are able to exhibit a much better outcome insofar as market growth is concerned. And more importantly, our focus on underwriting still remains the same. The very recent change that you're talking about will also mean that <clears throat> on the commercial lines portfolio, today, the wordings are largely the same between players in the market. So therefore, even if you want to offer a differentiated coverage or a term which is uh, relevant for a particular company or a sector, honestly, between players, we are not able to do that. So that's a change that will happen. Again, this particular change of deregulation of wordings is again a positive from a longer term perspective. From a short term, again, it could be, it could lead to some kind of price corrections also that's possible because some players may want to give a term which may not be so attractive for the corporate or for the company concerned, which not that every corporate understands the significance of the wording. So therefore, in the process, if their decisioning tends to base on price, then it's very much possible that it could lead to some kind of uh, competition or maybe some kind of uh, moderation in pricing. But long run, I think sensible companies understand what risks they are exposed to and therefore in the process it should be law beneficial uh, but short term there is possible so just to add to what gopal was you know saying uh, fire you know is essentially what we are talking about right. and you know when this deregulation happened in 2009 that is when the pricing was kind of deregulated and and the wordings were you know still kept uh, you know uh, what was there in that uh, erstwhile tariff <coughs> now different products have different you know mechanisms or so something like liability for example was never tariffed so wordings were always you know uh, free and all of us you know as companies have you know evolved you know as far as those individual wordings are concerned so what is being discussed currently on the wording part is basically allowing flexibility on the property uh, you know wordings it's also very you know relevant to see that if you look at the fire market uh, there is a small risk, the mid risk and the large risk. Even today, the large risk can be offered, you know, covers which are beyond tariff. You know, so anything which is more than 2500 crores, the sum insured, uh, the wordings can be agreed on a case-to-case -case basis and it is supported by the reinsurers. One of the good advantages, one of the strong advantages of the Indian market was, for example, when COVID, you know, kind of hit us. At that, point, at that point of time, there was contractual certainty, you know, uh, in fact, if you look at what has happened in the international markets, you know, some of the wordings were slightly, you know, because no one could uh, see that, you know, COVID can be a situation which can result into business interruption losses and some of these, you know, uh, losses did come, uh, you know, to the international markets and, and went through a court, uh, you know, a process. So when Gopal is talking about you know, challenges, uh, these are some of the challenges that if you introduce a wording without thinking through uh, the, the uh, you know, consequences, so the wording which exists in the market, they're well understood by the customers, by the intermediary. So even if you want to sell a product, you know, the intermediary or the channel should feel comfortable explaining the, prop, you know, product proposition to the, to the customer. The surveyors are used to using, you know, these wordings to assess the claims. So whenever a new uh, a flexibility in, in wording, uh, you know, definition is going to come, uh, you know, this is positive from a long term perspective because again, you know, reinsurers will only give capacities, you know, to players who understand, you know, the focus on the risk is, is would, would get enhanced, but in the short term, it might cause, you know, this, uh, this, this disruption. Some more competition. So, so, more than competition, I think it is uh, the ability of people to understand what they are giving and, and, you know, as it manifests, you know, so, so till that time, you know, the product is very controlled. Uh, in, you know, in, uh, unknown expo the probability of an unknown exposure, you assuming an unknown exposure is, is less, but you know, once it is, uh, you know, quite free, uh, some bit of a learning time might kind of come through. Yeah, because I think what, what will also happen, sorry. The point which you made related to that, if you said that we like the situation once uh, the, that uh, policy has got washed out and service levels are going to be elevated, that's why we want to come in and make aggressive investments and also start writing business. Uh, and you said 
but you still punctuate it by saying that towards the tail end, which is what you are making a point, that there is still a potential. Because what could happen? Price led competition still to play out. Because what will happen is, let's just imagine a situation, right? Today, if it's a well informed corporate then they will understand the wordings quite efficient, uh, effectively, which is the point that Yankur made. When it comes to very large risk, right. large risk exposures are well understood by corporates. And in any which ways, it will be significantly reinsured. The corporate also understands the risk reasonably well. And therefore, they know what to cover and therefore whether the languages or the, the coverages are adequate or not. But that may not be the same level of understanding when you go down the curve. Now, because today there was not so much of a challenge because the coverage was uniform. Every player in the market offered a standard uniform wordings insofar as uh, those policies are concerned. Going ahead, the moment it will get deregulated, you may start seeing differentiated wordings being offered by different players in the market. Now, what this could lead to, for example, you as a corporate may say that I ICSO Lombard is giving me a wording which <coughs> is related to that is a price. You may choose your decision basis price and you may in the process be willing to, let's say, accept the wording whatever is being offered by insurance company A. Whereas insurance company B will possibly do a fair assessment of actually the type of risk that you are exposed to and suggest a language which is appropriate for you from a risk management standpoint. And in the process, the price for that particular coverage or wordings could be slightly more <coughs> than what, let's say, company A has been offering. Now, in order to understand this differentiation, possibly will take some time. So, you may see players taking calls basis going with company A pricing. But you may realize that and the claim experience happens. You are not possibly ending up getting <coughs> the benefits of claims. So, hence, which is why we are saying short term there could be some challenges, including maybe some moderation in pricing, but long run it is very, very positive. So, that's one change you will see. The second is, again, again just a fallout of uh, this particular change. Today, the market largely operates on a co-insurance market, which is, I mean, not that every company will be able to absorb, let's say, risks worth thousands of crores. So, they tend to kind of co-share the risk with multiple insurance companies. Again, the language being the same across all players in the market. And the way the co-insurance market work currently works is one of the player is identified as a leader, which the customer decides. And the rest of the insurance companies with whom the risk is shared act as followers to the risk with whatever share, share percentages are. But again, as I said, the larger thought process being the language is largely uniform in terms of wordings. Today, it will start kind of move away from a co-insurance market into a subscription market, which is to say that, I mean, when, or even before I talk about subscription, under the co-insurance mechanism, the customer ends up paying the premium to one insurance company. That particular insurance company then does, does settlements of premium claims with other uh, followers who are co-sharers of risks. Uh, as I said, but the language being the same. But moving ahead, everything will move into a subscription model because I as an insurance company, even if the customer decides to make me as the leader, I may want to offer a wording which is to the advantage of the customer. And therefore, my price point could also be very different. As compared to some other insurance company to whom the uh, corporate may want to still act as a co-sharer uh, co of risk, they may still want to kind of place that risk separately. So effectively, you will see individual risk getting placed separately with each of the companies. And in the process, it could again stand beneficial for the uh, corporate concern. But then what spirit of co-sharing? Because the, the risk involved of 2-5 thousand crores of potential claim is something what yeah, will happen. Yeah. That then gets a little washed away. So that gets a little washed away, which actually again is a positive for yeah. let's say companies which are relatively better on balance sheet. Because, balance sheet. because today, a corporate for whatever reason may actually end up giving a 5% share just for to some other, to, let's say XYZ insurance company. Tomorrow, because I'm giving a wording which is far more beneficial to that corporate, he or she will think twice before giving any, let's say even a 5 or 10% share to some other players. And not every company will be able to observe the same type of, we will be able to give the same type of wordings. So hence, long run, very positive. Right. Short term, maybe some disruption. And just to another aspect, if I may just add yeah. another aspect of, of the subscription market is, one is that, you know, their ability to give cover. I think the biggest, another very big advantage is, what happens today is, so if you are the customer and I am the leader, I collect the premium from you and I distribute it to the followers. You know, when there is a claim, I do the assessment, I pay the claim to you and I collect it from the co-insurers. So from a credit risk perspective, you are kind of insulated. Now the moment a subscription market happens, you will have to give me premium for only my share and to him for his share and the real thing will be claim recovery. Right. So tomorrow, you know, a balance sheet, a small balance sheet size, you know, a, a solvency of say 1.56, 
would you be comfortable giving that co-insurance because you are not taking ownership of also recovering that you know from the uh, from the co-insurance directly which which basically will be an advantage for companies who have you know bigger balance sheet sizes so the onus then comes on to, the, to the, customer. the customer to the customer to search for this yes with that actually uh, i mean so in terms of evolution as you said that uh, deregulation and that so how how much of that is sort of playing out right now or it's effective april 23 as we speak right so, so yeah, yeah. Deregulation of commercial burnings is finalized. There, there's no committee which is uh, trying to discuss and finalize. It's already finalized. That's going to be needed. So I'm just saying that those are those discussions are definitely happening, but right. definitely it's likely to come into practice right. from April 23. And how much of the business is actually coming from these large players, like large corporates? Uh, so for us, if you look at again the three categories, what Ankur spoke about, which is small corporates, mid and let's say very large corporates, which understands. Right. These wordings far more effectively. On the large risk for segment, I think we will be present in almost close to about 75 to 80 percent of the risks. Uh, we are pretty much there in pretty much every account. We have a very large, market. We have a very large proportion. And the rest of it is an opportunity. So but what we have been doing on the commercial lines is every year we have been accreting market share. So sorry, on the market share, I didn't catch it. On the large risk category, you are about 20. we are almost at about in almost in 75 to 80 percent of the accounts we are already present. But present in what proportion? The it could be multiple proportion. I mean, say in some accounts we will be we will be with the leader with a fifty one percent market share. Okay, in some accounts I could be with a market share of let's let's say share of thirty percent. So when you say presence, that's sort of penetration of the that's a penetration of the number of accounts which are there that in that seventy five to eighty percent of the accounts. ICICI Lombard has got a participation. Okay. What share? It could vary between risk to risk depending on the uh, appetite that we may have also to kind of ride those risks. But some sense on that profile in the sense that number of business which is written every year, you know that number. So very short number. Very difficult to give you a specific number to it because each risk could be different. As I said, as some let's say a risk which is worth ten thousand crores, okay. even I may not want to take let's say fifty one percent share in that particular risk mm -hmm. at many a times because even I have my own risk appetite in terms of how much we can absorb and how much we would want to kind of depending on my reinsurance capacity that I'm buying. So hence I may take an exposure which we are, we think are comfortable. Whereas if it's a risk which is worth let's say thousand crores, there as I said I may end up taking a risk which is up to let's say fifty one percent for example. So it could vary between risk to risk. All that I'm saying is, the presence of us matters a lot because we are kind of pretty much there in every account of uh, majority of the accounts of that particular category. And the small and mid is you said it's an opportunity. I.e., we are not Should, present or very small. So we are pretty much there. If you look at overall commercial lines across categories, we will have a market share anywhere ranging between 12 to 15 percent for the category as a whole whether you take fire whether you take engineering whether you take marine cargo marine cargo by the way we are industry leaders um, fire engineering marine liability all of them we will have a market share range anywhere between 12 to 15% so uh, out of the total commercial line maximum impact of this should be on the fire uh, predominantly predominantly and uh, we are anyway seeding 75% of that business right not necessarily. It again is a function. Incrementally, we are not necessarily seeding so much because we are writing more of small and mid corporate uh, policies as well, which where relatively the extent of reinsurance is lower. Uh, so uh, again, it's not a fixed percentage that we reinsure seventy five percent of the risk. It's again a purely a function of the point that I made small on a risk which is let's say ten thousand crores. I may possibly tend to have a relatively slightly higher proportion of reinsurance as compared to risk which is relatively uh, lower in size. And generally, of the reinsurance. Are the rates hardening, or are you uh, seeing any? Uh, of course, because, because given that, that given that whatever we are seeing globally, seeing I think there are clearly catastrophic events. For, for forget about globally first. Even if you look at the Indian market, on an average, we should talk about one catastrophic event a year in the past. Today, you look at it, at least two or three cat events happen on an on a year on year, year year on year basis. So therefore, there is all the more the reason for us to us to be far more sensible on underwriting. Now, coming back to your point on will the rates harden? Yes. There will definitely be indications of rates uh, that will get hardened as we speak. And quarter four is a cycle at which we kind of end up negotiating our contracts of uh, reinsurance renewals because typically it's an annual uh, renewal buying that we end up doing on the reinsurance front. Um, in general, if you look at uh, our experience on underwriting, we have been largely writing the book at a combined of around 100%. Our commercial lines has been extremely profitable. And therefore, the relative outcome that we have been able to exhibit to the reinsurers have also been positive. And hence, to that extent, which is why you would have been hearing us consistently talk about two things. One, incrementally, we have always been able to improve our panel of reinsurers whom we are operating with, just to kind of make sure that we don't run with any credit risk, even the point that Akur made. 
and equally we try and make sure that we are able to get better terms of reinsurance. Now better terms could be again on two, uh, two counts. One is the commission on reinsurance that we get as an income. We will obviously try and maximize that. And two, for some of the catastrophic protections that we have to take. There is a cost of reinsurance that we are required to pay. So that again, as the exposures are increasing, we will obviously try and make sure that relative to the increase in exposures, the cost increase is not as much. So those are the two ways to which we kind of manage. But obviously, maybe we will come back in April and give you more better insights once we complete the renewal cycle. But as we speak, obviously, there is uh, rate hardening that is kind of clearly an indication. But the impact could be far more for some of the other companies which have been more adverse on their underwriting. Gopal, could you expand a bit on that part, both the sides of the reinsurance play, which is uh, your underwriting, you've written the underwriting the business and then you've done a sort of back. So let's say, that I, let's look at type of reinsurance is what we do. One is we do a proportionate reinsurance. Now, as the term proportionate reinsurance indicates, for whatever risk that I've assumed, I decide to, let's say, part with a proportion of that business, let's say 40%, okay. as an example. Okay. Okay. I'm just giving this an example. It could be 20 in some, 70 in others, 40 in some. I'm just giving this an example. So the term proportionate insurance is whatever risk that I assume, a proportion of that risk is what I'm giving to the reinsurer, which is why it's called as a proportionate reinsurance. Okay. On that proportion of reinsurance that I do with a set of reinsurance partners whom we have decided to work with, they give me a commission on reinsurance, which acts as an income to me. Now, that commission on reinsurance is a function of your quality of underwriting. If you are exhibiting a book which is relatively better, then obviously the terms of reinsurance commission that you get also tends to be far better. Historically, on the commercial lines, as I said, we have been running it fairly profitably, pro uh, profitable. Therefore, the terms of commission income that we have got have generally been favorable. Uh, so, that's what we will try even for the current uh, renewal cycle as well. The second element of reinsurance is post the proportionate reinsurance. And by the way, every risk, whatever you assume, there is a 4% obligatory that has to go to GIC, which is the General Insurance Corporation of India. That's mandated by guidelines. Uh, I, the proportionate part which I was talking about was more uh, uh, beyond the 4%. Um, so now, uh, let's assume whatever proportion you decided to do it on a proportionate basis. The rest of the risk after the obligatory is on your net account. I mean, what you retain on the net. Again, that net could be quite large. Let's say in a 1,000 crore exposure, even if you decide to let's say do a 40% reinsurance and let's say 4% of obligatory, all of that put together, let's assume 44%. Still, 56% of the book is quite large. You may not be able to kind of absorb that loss because in the event if that loss happens, your, your balance sheet should be able to absorb those uh, impact. So, which is why we enter into what we call as a non-proportional or uh, excess of loss protection, which is to largely address losses resulting from individual peak instances or it could be losses resulting from catastrophic events. So you have to protect both mm -hmm. to make sure that again <clears throat> you manage your PNL well and more importantly you are not putting your balance sheet but to risk. Will that, okay, just to sort of put, paraphrase that, will, it's similar to kind of taking a, a group insurance of the group of business you've written that the second tier right. So one you've done a proportionate which you've done very clear you know the risk you've taken and you've been paid for the better underwriting. That part very well explained. Correct. The balance 60 itself is very large exposure. Yeah. And you are doing it at two ends. Yes. As you said rightly. The Again, end. one is for individual risks that I'm protecting. Yeah. And then and the two is a collective risk. Of collective risk that I'm protecting. Right. So at a point of time, my one risk can get impacted. Right. Let's say if there's a fire in this building. Right. And this exposure is let's say 1000 crores. So if this entire fire gets, if this entire building gets gutted for whatever reason. Though the probability is less, but uh, let's assume for a moment it gets completely cut. In which case, there's a thousand crore loss. Can I take thousand crore? And let's assume in my example, I decided a proportionate reinsurance of forty percent all inclusive, which means six hundred crores will come and hit my net. Do I have the capacity to take six hundred crores of loss on my PNL? Is a question mark that I'm seeking. Where, which is where I said I will take enter into a non-proportional or excess of loss protection to manage that six hundred crores of exposure to say that in the event of individual large losses. My risk on the PNL will not exceed a particular rupee value. Hmm. That's a part of my reinsurance contract on the non-proportional or on the excess of loss. Right. That's a rupee value that I will negotiate. So in this case, say 50 crores. So in this case, whatever the threshold is, yeah. let's say 50 crores. So, 50 crores. so I may choose. Yeah, and it's, it's very interesting. So just one final sort of granular thing. In the proportionate part, clearly what you're trying to do, I, I think you've said it. I'm just trying to learn it, which is you're trying to, as you said, optimize both the PNL and the balance sheet. By paying a lump sum 50 crores, 
you're you're basically trying to create the leverage on the other portion that right. in 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 a very simplistic fashion, right? Basically, yeah. on the single risk and as you said, the collective risk. Yeah. So I'll 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 just close the loop on the single and then I'll come to the collective risk also. So on the single, effectively, in my example of six hundred crores. I may not want to take 600. I may choose to keep only, let's say, 15 crores or 50 crores, whatever that number is. So I am saying my PNL, I'm okay to take 50 crores. Right. So you're capping the rest it. of the things, I'm kind of again parting it out to a panel of reinsurers. For which you are paying that For I'm required to pay that cost. Yeah. So that's the second thing that I need to work as a part of my re reinsurance renewals to make sure that the cost of reinsurance of protecting that individual peak losses, I manage it within acceptable levels. Right. Now it is quite possible an event can Im impact multiple risks at the same time. Flood or any other catastrophic event, an earthquake, <coughs> if it happens. It can impact multiple disks at the same time. So that, again, when I That's collectively put all those exposures of the net, it could be a, a very large proportion. So there again, what I do is again enter into a non-proportional arrangement to say that <clears throat> from an ISIS Lombard perspective, in the event of a catastrophic loss, which impacts multiple of risks at the same time, again, I am willing to take a net impact of X Indian rupees, beyond which it will be paid by a panel of reinsurers. Now, again, it is not that the panel of reinsurers are going to pay you indefinite mm -hmm. or unlimited. Right. It comes with a cap. Right. But the cap that we buy, we test it every year. This is the exposures that we take. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen is the level of reinsurance that we buy. We kind of test it to the worst of the situations that we experienced in the right. past. For example, Mumbai floods is the worst of the floods that we have experienced historically for the last several years. And on the incremental exposure, it is not that we go back to 2005 exposures. We have been increasing exposure since then. On today's exposures, if an event of a Mumbai flood was to similarly get recurred, then what is the extent of my reinsurance layers that will get consumed by virtue of the loss that one could experience? Generally, what we have seen, it gets consumed to the tune of about anywhere between 15 to 20 percent. And that's what we model, which means the level of protection that we buy is still fairly large enough. So 15 to 20, would you mean one fifth? That means you have bought only five one x more. Five x more. Yeah. That's a way to kind of look at it. That's I will not say we have bought more. Right. It's but just it's that we want to be conservative. So it's like that 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 we have bought for a fairly large event, which right. can give us comfort, that saying that right. even if that event of that magnitude happens, right. our reinsurers are there to kind of pay for the losses. Right. Now this could be different for different players. Yeah. Some companies may choose to buy a limit of reinsurance, which is far more limited. Because at the end of the day, it's a risk reward, right? You have right. to pay a cost corresponding to which you get a protection. Company may choose to kind of be far more aggressive in their reinsurance buying philosophy. Yeah. And they may choose to buy a limit which is far more conservative, I mean far more aggressive. Okay. Just to kind of protect some costs today. Right. But when the event happens, right. is when you start to pay a price. Sure. And again, live examples, the same Mumbai flood examples, two companies went under. I don't want to name the companies, yeah. but two companies' protection was significantly inadequate. They had to dip in beyond the limit that they had bought in so far as reinsurance cover is concerned. Even in Chennai floods. Even in Chennai floods. So those are examples. So, so hence, you have to be very, very careful in the extent of reinsurance buy that you do, besides of, of the obvious commercials that you kind of end up doing the transaction. So another right. aspect is how much you buy and the, sec the next extension is that, you know, when I need to make a recovery, do you have the financial capability of paying that or not? Yeah, the quality of the, the quality of the insurer. Yeah, which is what you said, the panel and we keep looking at So, so there are two parts, that's absolutely. That's One is the absolute commercials, yeah. that what is the cost that I am paying or what is the commission that I am getting and the second point is, today, for example, I can work with the triple B also and maybe get a 10% lower cost or maybe 2% extra commission. But when the claim would come, you know, now the point is short tail exposure, long tail exposure. So there are multiple facets to kind of look at it. It's an engineering project. What I'm writing today, the claim will come after 10 years. Sure. Is that entity going to be there and I want to make a recovery? Okay. So I think this is what we try to do, uh, you know, uh, from a reinsurance perspective. So now just to put everything together, now with this IIB, you know, thing or this detariffing, you know, uh, 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 kind of coming, obviously commercial and businesses require insurance, you know. Now, this is going to create some short-term, you know, challenges, but at the same time, from a long-term perspective, when the reinsurers, the global majors, you know, who are there, the top five or the top ten reinsurers, they would then want to partner with companies who have a very sound, you know, risk uh, understanding and a, and a, a practice, and that is where the differentiation should, you know, should kind of uh, start to come in. 
Right. So, so I mean, so it's a good balance between this proportionate selling out that what you talked about, and one is what you pay out for the, the for protecting the, the individual losses and individual uh, losses and the, the group the losses. losses. So this proportional again is also at a portfolio level. Yeah. You know, so we do an annual contract and whatever we write, depending upon the size and nature, you know, that session automatically happens. But for your underwriting skills, are you sort of being bidded up and paid better? Yeah. Which is what you said. So that Absolutely. Is, that's uh, it. That's exactly. The insurers want to get your exactly. Your business. Exactly. Because end of the day, when so Ankur manages the reinsurance, end of the day, we actually end up in a situation where we have more takers than, which may not be true for every players in the market. It all depends. At the, as I said, at the end of the day, it all depends on the quality of underwriting that you do. So out of 100 rupees, let's take basically reinsure for 65 or 70. Does it, the remaining becomes a, becomes... So it's the other way around. If you see on an average out of the 100 rupees of premium that we write as a company, we retain 70% roughly and possibly our extent of reinsurance is to the tune of 25-30%. And the reason is because today if you look at almost more than two-thirds of my business is motor and health, which are relatively small ticket exposures as compared to a property exposure. And on the retail lines, I kind of pretty much retain everything. Leave aside the 4% obligatory which I talked about. But on the commercial, it's much higher. Right? Commercial, yeah. it could be higher because, 60, 70 which we are, because the risk exposures risk are higher. higher. The risk exposures are higher. So you need to manage the risks appropriately. So given the choice, I would want to retain everything. You so know? probably next uh, couple of years, because of tariffs and because of all this issue, there could be some pressure on this business, which was probably the most profitable in the last two, three years, given the issues with the auto. So which is what we believe. I think all the changes in the guidelines or regulations which are coming through as we speak over the last whatever has got announced in the last six to nine months, most of them will be short term challenging because that could be for various reasons. But long run, it is significantly beneficial for companies like ICS Gopal, wanted to move into retail lines of business, and I have a very basic question. So, if you look at, if you look at the industri industry, yeah, just the private industry, the profit market share of you know uh, is much more concentrated than the premium market share. So, basically, these insurer hai, only three or four make money, right? What do you do differently versus the others, which keeps you consistently on the right side? And what makes it difficult for the other players to generate profit in this industry? One is the intent. <laughs> so that's the starting point. So I, I'm, I'm trying to be as straightforward as what it can be. It's very simple, right? Now, you, you look at till 2008, there were 16, 17 players. Post 2008, another 16, 17 players entered the market. The question is, what did what is the approach that each of these companies took? Did they wanted to create something differentiated in the market? To your point on, are they creating something which is a moat or a USP or an advantage, whichever way you want to kind of call it as? Or did they go with an approach of driving, using price as a means to gain some market share? Possibly many companies took the latter part. To say that I will use price as a lever and they obviously... Exactly to your point on some of the key motor lines are easy to tap into. But the end outcome is what we largely look at. I mean, today you look at the tail of companies which are operating at a combined which is significantly elevated. And therefore, corresponding to that, the solvency is equally in that sense stressed uh, for them to kind of uh, exhibit that for a relatively longer period of time. The call that ICC Lombard took, even during those times when the market were very, very aggressive at different points of time. This is not just in one instance, which we have spoken in the past. Multiple instances in the past, we have seen different segments exhibiting periods of aggression. It's the question of what is it that the institution wants to drive. As a company, our philosophy for ICC Lombard has been to drive profitable growth as a theme. And that's something they have done in the past. That's something that we are talking about even as we look forward. So that's a call that each company has to take. What is it that you want to drive? So that will that's the first and the foremost starting point. The second is particularly in the retail lines, as all of you understand, distribution becomes a very, very important lever. Now, how robust a distribution you are able, you are able to kind of create also leads into economies of scale. And with that, if you are also able to blend technology as a part of it, then to that extent, you are also able to drive it far more efficiently in terms of overall productivity gains. Now, there again, if you look at motor, we kind of cl clearly built a lot lot of, let's say, moat or strength insofar as initially kind of focusing a lot on point of dealership. So it was our own, I mean, employees of ICS Lombard who act as field force, present at the point of dealerships, 
built that relationship over years and today therefore given the years of working with them we believe we are able to kind of possibly get a share of portfolio which is to our liking and this may not be true in every dealership touch point we will obviously want ideally prefer to have 100% of our preferred segments but many times you may not be able to get that but we will try as much as possible to get a relatively better share of uh, mix of portfolios that we want to underwrite so therefore staying invested in distribution and creating that relationship obviously plays a very very important and today if you look at on motor of the total number of uh, dealerships that we have roughly we are present in almost about 55 to 60% of the total number of uh, dealership counters on the private car side uh, so that clearly acts as a huge uh, advantage for us more importantly then what we also try to create as a capability today is on the claims front i mean all of us know uh, your dealer is not having an unlimited space in terms of turn around for uh, the vehicle servicing and through use of technology and uh, the use of instaspect app we have been able to do a live video streaming of the entire survey process and in the process you are actually able to help the workshop create better margins which actually kind of quite resonates quite well for the garage person and therefore they are willing to part part businesses with companies like ICC Nobat who are similar like minded set of companies they are willing to kind of place businesses with those type of companies so that again acts as a huge advantage to us increasingly what we are also getting to is if you see many of the motor vehicle repairs could be many motor vehicle damages could be either repaired or it could be replaced i mean some of the parts may require a replacement generally the procurement of this parts would be done by let's say the garage person through third party suppliers uh, and each of them may be kind of possibly placing orders separately for replacement of parts what we are also trying to see can we act as aggregators of those parts mm. and make them available for the uh, various garages so in the process you are able to again try to strike some kind of an advantage relative to pricing and these are all small amounts which can start making a difference in the overall cost of claims that's another thing that we are kind of significantly driving the last piece is the decision to uh, completely insource the entire claim adjudication process i mean this is again a decision that motor specifically we took it several years back even on health we took 10 years back so we don't work with any of the third party external uh, claim adjudicators whether it is on motor or whether it is on health so we have automobile engineers who act as uh, or on the roles of ics lobard and we have doctors who are on the roles of ics lobard they act as adjudicators of claim and they are able to create a lot of value to us because they are able to have direct we are able to have direct supervision over them they are able to look at claims between similar type of claim incidences at different locations different places different models and compare and see the need for any of those changes to be made or the repairs to be done including questioning hospitals for example as to why a particular treatment is being done so the whole objective is to try and make sure that the overall cost of claim whether it is motor or health is kept under check so those are some of the attributes that we have been able to create over years which we believe is acting as strengths for us what's the outlook for auto space in terms of growth not just growth competition pricing so the good part is competition as what we have been speaking over the last few earnings call at least one if you look at the aggressiveness what all of you referred to motor has led to a combined of 124% now in our last 22 years we have never seen motor of combined ratios at 124% so that tells you a story in terms of how competitive the market had become in the last few years generally in motor we see cycles of competition but typically the comeback in is within a maybe an 18 to 24 month cycle this time the cycle has been much more longer again for understandable reasons because we saw a perfect storm of many things that came in the last during covid period now, all of those are behind us every aspect of it so therefore there is no reason this 124 combined can be a sustaining one and hence in the recent calls we have been talking about and that's what you are seeing on the ground as well most of the players who are very aggressive in the last 12 months seems to be kind of talking starting to talk to get reasonable now i am not saying that suddenly the number of 124 has moved to 100 but there is a definitely been a change from 124 to lower than that number pricing has started changing it is pricing people have started to look at the overall there is this proposed draft on expense of management which caps the limit on the overall cost of whatever doing business at 30% there are a lot of players who are beyond that 30% threshold and in the case of health insurance business companies the cap is at 35 a lot of companies are beyond 35% and clearly the regulator is talking about a glide path to bring it down within those thresholds whatever that limits are so there is stress on 
those players to become far more efficient in the overall cost of doing business. So again, people are starting to get far more reasonable. Now, all of this is definitely again long term positive. Uh, because we have again in this period why we would have slightly underperformed on growth but we have not we have not shied away from continuing to make those investments in distribution service and technology so we are kind of positioned to capitalize the opportunity for growth Sir, Omar, 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 just just capital to clarify on that earlier point Sorry. Uh, you said the uh, commercial lines also you insist on writing it at 100% that, that's what you meant commercial lines has generally been very profitable for us yeah, but you said you write it at 100. Uh, it at could be less than 100 also. Less than 100. That, that's what you, the word you use versus 125 for autos. Uh, that's correct. 124 is for the industry combined. Yeah. Yeah. And 100%, less than 100% is the combined ratio for ICC Lombard on the commercial portfolio. And for motor, do you uh, talk about yourself versus the industry? So, motor really, which is why we are underperforming the market, right? So, yeah. if you look at growth. So, you clearly not done We have con anything. consciously, for example, you look at our mix of private car, two wheeler, and commercial vehicles. Last year mix. Private car was roughly about 55%. My two-wheeler was roughly about 27-28%. And my commercial vehicles was roughly about 17-18%. If you look at current year, my mix of private car is less than 50. It's close to about 49%. My two-wheeler has been an inherent strength. It has been more or less maintained at 27%. Commercial vehicles for the reasons that we have explained, but the, that mix is closer to about 23 to 25%. So the competition has been significantly elevated in the private car space. And hence, it's not that we have vacated distribution. That's very, very important for us. We have possibly moderated shares in some of the counters. Well, just a question on, sorry, uh, on, uh, is there a fleet and a, uh, that's a group level in the auto side also? Meaning, as an example, let's say, uh, I believe Uber has a lot of their proprietary uh, taxis that they have bought and then given them on a rental model to the driver partners as they're called. Yeah. But it's Uber's insurance. In yeah. So, so commercial vehicles generally could work on fleets as well. Uh, so but I'm... what you're saying. But not for, uh, two, uh, not for four wheelers. Private car and two wheelers will be more individual specific. Is really private as an individual. I mean, owners. largely. Yeah. Okay. Predominantly, I would say. Uh, yesterday, uh, we attended IRTA it's a regulator's presentation. And one thing which, you know, it was very clear is to get more number of players and it, it looked from his commentary that he wants competition to be a lot more intense than you know what we've seen. Yeah. I mean, motor is not an exceptionally competitive market, but yeah. uh, how do you see the profit pool? You know, I mean, while yes, most of the companies are still at the early stage of development, and you know they will be investing. But how do you see the profit pool really emerging for the sector? Yeah. And frankly, after listening to his presentation. The only thing I could think of that one such regulator who had made similar comments was a telecom regulator in the past. Yeah. And we've seen how the cycle has really been yeah. seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very, very relevant one. Yeah. No. So which is what which is why I started off in the initial saying that the regulatory reforms, whatever is being announced, short in the short run there could be disruptions. In the long run, definitely they are far more beneficial. And and let me close loop on the licenses part that you referred to. Now, if you look at the larger thought process, I'm sure the chairman must have spoken about that. He would have started with the 2047 philosophy, yeah. which is insurance yes. for all, right? Yes. Which is, and penetration for all. That's a larger theme within which this is being driven at. Mm -hmm. Two, if you look at the thought process of the regulator, is similar to what is there on the banking side. Mm -hmm. If you look at banking, pretty much there are different categories of banks which cater to needs of customers, <coughs> whatever their needs are. Which is why you have a full-fledged bank, you have a small finance bank, you have an NBFC, you have a regional rural bank, you have a cooperative bank. Now, each of them cater to different segments of customers. Larger objective is banking for all. A similar thought process is there on the insurance side to make sure that there are differentiated licenses that are being issued. And each of them possibly caters to the specific requirements that insurance customers may have. And in the process, drive the agenda of increasing insurance penetration. So hence, we will have to see what type of companies get a license. Mm -hmm. If these are niche, product-specific, geography-specific companies who want to come and do business, it for ISIS number, it does not impact us so much. But it may impact in the segment or in the geography where that particular company is going to get a license to. But if it is someone which comes like a pan-India license, similar to, let's say, what ISIS number is doing, then there could be some temporary stress. Like similar to what I explained, in 2008, there were 16, 17 players. Since then, there were another 17 players added to the market. So we did see stress getting exhibited. But the challenge is today, the market is already 119% combined. 
Now, the ability of unless you come and tell me that this particular private company is willing to come with a deep capital burn model, then that's a different story. But we don't think, at least in the private space, big companies willing to come and have an extended period of deep capital burn model. And two, it's not a capitalist free flowing thing. I mean, that's what we have seen. Thirdly, thanks to reality checks, not just in insurance, in multiple sectors, this price to revenue led valuations have got kind of come back to some reasonableness. And therefore, there will definitely be aggression which could be exhibited by some of these entrants. But that's the nature of the market. So I, I agree that, but you know, just to follow up on that, if you, if you look at like 119 percent combined ratio, from industry is actually not healthy, you know, frankly. I mean, and while, you know, I take all the points that, you know, it's underpenetrated, we need insurance, but do you think the way, I mean, to continue with 119% kind of loss ratio on a combined basis for an extended period of time, it's more like a weakening, you know, kind of a, I mean, is it really that healthy? I mean, what has been the presentation from the incumbent players to the regulator and has there been any dialogue? As in, you know, I mean, maybe players like, you know, ACO doing like really, you know, 120, 130 kind of loss ratios. Is this something concerning for you as, not just as a market leader losing share, that's fine. But do you see this is like a really big structural risk for the profit pool of... So which is what we had mentioned. I think for us, according to, from our standpoint, 124 combined just on motor specific yes. cannot be a sustainable one. Right, So that's one change and as I said already we are seeing signs of a lot more players who are very aggressive in the last 12 months starting to talk to get far more reasonable and reasonable is on both counts, both in terms of pricing and to the proposed draft that I talked about on the expense of management guideline. It's not that players are operating at a combined of 95-96%, in which case some of the players who are more than let's say the defined norms could actually let's say get a some kind of a breather, it's not the case. All those, many of the players who are beyond that defined threshold are operating at a combined which is significantly adverse. So therefore, the headroom that could possibly be available may not be existent at all. Thirdly, if you look at generally the philosophy, I'm sure the chairman has spoken, spoken on that as well. Increasingly, the regulator is also wanting to make sure that the overall cost of sourcing of businesses is reasonable. And which is why even under the proposed EOM guidelines, for even those companies which currently are exceeding the threshold, they have to specifically put out a glide path within three years to bring down within the threshold. That's one. And even otherwise, they are in general saying the overall cost of business has to reduce. So, in all fairness, now to close loop, the market has to kind of get better than the 119 combined. On the auto disruption now, if we speak to other mature player like you, most of the people are uh, looking at retail health and competition over there has increased. Mm. Uh, in few of the conversations with hospital companies, they also themselves said, you know, the discount that they used to give to insurance companies has reduced significantly. You also, in your call, mentioned that uh, you are looking more uh, selling of or increasing the mix into health insurance. What's happening there? Oh, so there have been a lot of price hikes. Which price are, hikes, which... Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think, um, so for us, one, on the health insurance, definitely a preferred segment for us as what we have explained. And uh, the two categories that we are in is corporate and retail. On the corporate side, again, just to kind of refresh, last year we did talk about affecting a price revision of 15 to 20%. In reality, we ended up with a price revision much higher than that. And over and above that, in the current renewal cycle, which is for the current 22-23 financial year uh, renewals, we have still been able to get a reasonable price increase over and above the last year's price change. And despite that, insofar as customer retentions are concerned on the corporate side, we have not seen any drop in our customer retentions. Uh, so hence, kind of that's doing very well. Uh, one, one thing, the combined ratio for the corporate... Combined ratio for the corporate will always be... So for, for us, it's re quite okay. Uh, because we do write relatively large corporates and at the same time small and mid-corporate uh, companies. Uh, when you look at the combination of both of this will lead to a loss ratio of anywhere between 94-95%. And generally the delivery of these uh, services are directly with co these companies. 
and therefore that's largely a single digit cost of uh, whatever sourcing and then hence on a blended basis the portfolio will run at a combined ratio of around 100 to 101 percent uh, this so is the corporate health. Corporate, corporate health corporate. this is just corporate health i talked about large corporates and small and mid corporates both put together so loss ratio about 94 95 single digit cost of acquisition and therefore a blended basis combined ratio about 100 to 101 percent the large corporate is where the combined ratio is Slack, higher, right? Because you have higher risk of So, not necessarily. It's a it again, there the, there the relative cost of distribution will be far lower. Because the competition because. at the large corporate is very high, that's what. So, we don't write those very large BFSI and tech accounts. Okay. Because that's exactly what happens. And those accounts may be there this year, next year I may not even have it. They will change uh, also, right? Yeah, money in our portfolio. Which is the reason why I said we don't write any of those very, very large BFSI and tech accounts. Largely, we try to build a book which is far more granular. So that you are able to get some reasonable price and the overall portfolio experience on the combined ratio is within our acceptable thresholds. Um, on the retail side, retail benefit is again a critical illness offering, generally profitable. Last two years we did have some challenge on the overall contribution of retail benefit because of the decision of the bank to stop discontinuing third party retail benefit offering. And two, even the scale of disbursements of Institutions with whom we had a tie up to offer retail benefit also was scaled down. Again, both of them are behind us, which is why if you look at our current nine month deck on the non ICC bank led growth, that's kind of growing at about 45%. But of course, it has two factors. The scale of disbursements are back and two, it's obviously on a lower base. So hence, we'll have to kind of sustain. But the benefit business is kind of doing well for us, generally profitable. On the retail health indemnity, the business that you're referring to, it's again a preferred segment for us. And that's an area where we're investing a lot on building distribution. To your point on uh, loss development uh, behavior, of course, that's something that we keep watching. And we see if there is a need for us to affect any kind of a price revision or not. For example, if you remember the last price revision that we took was in quarter three of 2021, roughly a weighted average price increase of 8% on the overall portfolio. Currently, as we speak, we have, we have affected a price revision on the renewal book, which is 20%. So it's not that we have shied away from affecting a, a price change. So what would be the combined after this price? Uh, so we'll have to wait and see in terms of what, what the... Is our assessment like? As, as I said, as, so end of the day on retail health indemnity, which is what we said, our loss ratios are within our acceptable levels, which is around that 65 to 70 percent kind of range. Our cost of acquisition currently is in the range of 35 to 40 percent, which is why we said on a blended basis, my retail health indemnity is running at a combined ratio of 105 to 110. That's primarily because we are at this point of time investing on building that distribution. Early signs of the investments playing out to our advantage in line with what we have been speaking. But we'll have to sustain that even as we speak on an ongoing basis. Sorry. As the, so I'll, I'll come as the revenue kicks in, we should see the benefit of efficiency of scale play out, which is what we have been kind of talking about. So for the large players, uh, their expectation of 95% post uh, these price hikes, twenty percent, twenty five percent. Is that reasonable, or it's still sounds like? I think we'll have to wait for people to deliver ninety five percent combined. Though we believe retail health indemnity from an ISO loan standpoint, we would want to see the book running at a combined closer to hundred percent. But is it good that you know these price hikes have been taken and? Uh, it's obviously a good thing. So, so, which is what I'm saying. So, if you see, we we took the price decision in twenty twenty one ahead of the market, and then one year into it is where most of the players kind of talked about a price change. Right. Having said that, the point that I made on motor, where we are also acting as, let's say, spare parts aggregators, similar thing is what we are trying to do even on the health front, to try and see how, again, it's our own uh, in-house claims management team, right? So their objective is to try and see how we can possibly divert, maybe India is a very, one of the very, I mean, hardly you will see in any other markets where a customer doesn't inform the insurance company before going for a treatment. If that happens, we are able to divert a lot of the customers to preferred service providers where you are able to get a better rate, package rate, and therefore, thereby you are able to keep the overall cost of claims under check. So that's something that we increasingly try and do uh, to keep the overall uh, cost of claims under check. To your point on, uh, you are already seeing, let's say, hospitals uh, uh, showing elevated billings. So we consciously work on bringing, bringing that down. But that we are able to exhibit in largely, I would say, tier 2 and tier 3 hospitals, where relatively the insurance billings is a much larger proportion to their overall, re overall revenues, and therefore we are able to get a better deal. Can I do that with a tier A hospital? No. Because still insurance billing in their overall revenues is a very, very small proportion. So I am not able to get the best of the package rates. 
So there we may be slightly more, in that sense, higher on the cost of claims. But the larger objective is to try and see through various interventions, keep the overall cost of claims under check. And in the process, the price point for the customer is reasonable. The last piece which we are trying to do is more the adoption of IL Take Care app, which is the same philosophy as what we had on the commercial lines front, which is value-added services in the form of more preventive, more wellness-related uh, behavior. Our hypothesis is in the long run, this should hopefully translate into reduced number of hospitalization. But we are not breaking anything right now in the numbers, what we are talking about, consequent to this. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verification of the data, which you said, so the, the, the retail health indemnity business, you said the loss. Loss ratio is about 65 to 70. 65 to 70. And the sourcing is about 30 35 to 40%. So you said 105, we are happy to run it. 105 to 110 is where we are currently running it at. Currently running it at. Uh, 95 was that other discussion, so I understood that. Contrasting that with the combined corporate, uh, what you said, with the loss numbers as high as 95%. That's correct. Right. So, uh, how is that uh, contrast? Can you just explain that? Because generally, when I do a negotiation with the corporates, we'll try to squeeze the maximum out of you. Right. So, you're saying so the, that corporate, the corporate is. That, that slack or the less that you get out of that so the on account of the scale of the, the pricing. pricing. The pricing that you get from a corporate is generally much lower. Much lower. Right. Uh, and and the hence, the sourcing cost is a single digit number, right. which is why so I said, which is why I said on the aggregate, when you look at it from a combined ratio standpoint, it is a 100, 101% kind of a book. Right. Whereas when you look at retail, right. the pricing is reasonably okay. The loss ratio at which the book is currently operating, it is anywhere between 65 to 70 percent. Given the investments that we are making on building distribution, my cost of distribution is currently at 35 to 40 percent. So therefore, my current combined ratio on the retail health indemnity is 105 to 110. As the revenue kicks in on the investments that we are making, automatically we should be able to bring down the combined from the 105 to 110 closer to a threshold of 100 percent. That's a thought process. Right. So don't think that anything right. is right. to a platform. I mean, it's something that we've obviously stayed away from. Yeah. Any, I mean, how are we going to solve for that? Because there's clearly a big growth opportunity sitting there. On the policy aggregators platform, yes. you're saying? Uh, we are building our own capability, ICCLombard.com. Yes. So, but therefore, it's far more efficient and far more economical for us to kind of build that platform. But do you not solve for growth if you actually... So, honestly, at this point of time, maybe okay. we could be wrong. At least for the foreseeable future, we don't see... Insurance in India completely moving into a online space. You still need a multi-channel, multi-distribution, multi-product approach for you to be able to kind of source businesses across different product segments. Take motor. The sheer convenience of a customer getting a policy at the point of dealership is not going to change. But at the renewal time. So at the renewal time, so which is what we consciously track. We track what is the cost of distribution that I have to pay to that platform, vis-a-vis -vis the cost of digital marketing, which I do it on ICSLombard.com. I find that to be far more efficient. LTV to CAC is... So that's what I keep checking. And what the policy platforms do is so correct. I said, I said, I said, Lombard customer, I can tell you this. I have just renewed this three months ago. I had a dozen calls before the Lombard guy actually called and said, Sir, aapka policy renew ho And I was actually surprised right? because obviously this data is now out there. Mm. Uh, and I asked each and every one of them as a shareholder, that where did you get this data and they said available and freely and at least a dozen people have called. Is it health or motor? Motor. Motor. A dozen people. So, I I mean, so even practically, I would like to think that uh, there is clearly an opportunity there. At least that's my sense and even talking to us. So, when you say multi-product, multi-modal, multi-channel distribution, why not one of these as well? Means you could continue to build or you think that gets diluted if you go on a platform. No, all that we are saying is at this point of time, the trade-off between the underwriting outcome of sourcing a business through that channel is not viable for us. Is it so it's not the underwriting outcome and not just CAC? It's nothing to do with only CAC. All that I'm saying is from the, at the end of the day, I have to look at it from an underwriting outcome, right? And for which, in so far as risk selection is concerned, we know which risk to select. So therefore, hmm. that's not a challenge. What is the next element? It's a cost of distribution. Hmm. Now, from whatever the policy platforms does, they are right in what they're doing. Because they will obviously want to maximize their earnings by looking at which companies' products they do, do they want to push. Sure. Any company who is willing to give them an incremental cost that. of distribution is what they would want to largely push. Vis-a-vis -vis that is what we compare on building our own platform, which is icsolombar.com. And if I have to spend money on digital marketing to acquire a customer, what is it that I'm end ending up spending? 
today i am finding that to be far more economical as compared to paying it to the platform so you would rather build your site rather i will build that's exactly what we have done that we have build your site so make or buy decision that part is okay but i think one level higher question of the marketplace itself right which is to his point or to individuals who do general sort of motor insurance every a couple of years or every year also are you in some sense losing market share at the market right. level because not because of the, the platform at least share, not right? because of the platform at least because which is exactly the point that i make yeah. at least in the indian market yeah. we don't see at least for the foreseeable future a sudden shift on people looking to go and buying policies only on through the platform, platform. only okay. through the platform okay. because we do track customer journeys right. we do companies we do see customers going to these platforms we do see customers going and doing research online right but the eventual decision in many of the product right. lines particularly right. in health for yes. example yes. they end up doing a sale which is through an agent through a friend or through some form of a telephony assistance i i think i mean so, i am reflective of the personal behavior i mean so so so, so 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 hence but what is equally important to your point it is important to create that channel of sourcing yes. so which is the channel that we are investing in we are building icsolombot.com exactly to address some customers who are maybe informed who want to let's say get into completely an online form of buying that's a capability created but there are two parts but then we are not able to compare for whatever it is worth like motor is i think the second third year is so even, is easy. so even compare the price button the so we never go. want to be that's exactly the point you so don't want we to don't want to be so insurance is not just about an e-commerce sale where you end up buying a product and that's the end of the process there is a service experience in fact that's a product that we sell that matters a lot no no gopal made two yeah, very interesting really points to, uh, one last question please uh, we started a little late also <laughs> we'll <laughs> take that and bring it later uh, to the full full list but if anybody has a meeting please no. uh, so you made two interesting points that make and buy decision where you are plug and play and and also you layered it with the fact that we are not sure of the quality of the underwriting you made that two distinct points and then you said the market is currently not ready on buying this insurance online etc what part of your distribution that you are creating is potentially ready for the plug and play if this market were to evolve and what evidence would you want to see so today i would a capable to today to today customer today customers who want to buy motor insurance online can go to my website and buy motor insurance online but only from you let's say right because they are innately ready for that part versus the price behavior which is what you said it's not that but it's also the the service uh, element etc so pe- so then you are not addressing that part of the customer who shopping around from a price perspective in some sense not necessarily someone that's what i said we track customer buying behaviors if someone who wants to come and buy from an icsl lombard they can come and buy from icsl lombard.com right but they there is no assurance that he or she will find the cheapest from icsl lombard Okay, let me ask this question even more in, in another fashion. Are you saying from the behavior tracking that people who buy it on online portals essentially the quality of the insurance underwritten their customer behavior that could vary between experience to experience. That could vary between experience to experience because it also depends on what model are you kind of getting your policies bought for. Each model may exhibit a loss experience which could be very different. Okay. So there are multiple factors to the loss outcome. Okay. The only point that I'm trying to make is. we will never want to be compared ourselves as even in some models we may be by far the best in price right. but we never want to lend a brand of icis lombard to a platform which significantly sells on price as a means to drive so, business rather growth. than services and everything service is the element what we be largely comfortable with which is the point that i am making and second is we do compare the relative cost of sourcing which i would exhibit to a platform and the same amount of money if i were to spend in digital marketing between the two which is far more efficient So far, we have seen far more efi- efficiency Internet. getting created internally. What is your digital sourcing percentage? In terms of value of business, it's about four percent of the total premium that we write across business. Across businesses, but largely in retail. terms of large, it is primarily retail. Yeah. And in terms of count of policies, it's about nine to ten percent. Okay, interesting. Because it's a relatively small ticket. What uh, is policy. the evidence you look for, Gopal, for that transition? One is you hard marketing numbers, digital internal sourcing versus third party, what the platform demands. Yeah. The, cut or the kickback yeah. or tomorrow rate. if any of this become platform starts to become too big a, uh, a platform where you cannot avoid like kind of working with those platforms at that point of time we will think so that that's so you are you are saying that industry scale is we, what we don't think at this point of time which is where the point that i made one is they become too big a platform for us to kind of ignore right. second 
customers suddenly starting to move everything to buy online, we will kind of track those buying journeys. So right now the industry would be like, uh, this 4 and 8 percent, the industry mix would be... Uh, uh, it won't have specifically that number, but I can share that with you separately. And uh, the last question on retail, uh, with these price hikes, can we go 65 to 70 percent claim? Could we be closer to 65 percent? There is also a claim inflation as well, right? Yeah. So, so there's also an element of claim inflation, so which is why we give that range. We are okay to kind of run the retail health portfolio at a loss ratio range of 65 to 70, which kind of factors in for whatever price uh, uh, increases that we have to make, plus the anticipated claim inflation that and one is able to. scale, that 105, 110 bring to 100%, what is that uh, operating leverage coming on, like which expense? Uh, it could be multiple expenses. You have to look at it overall from the cost of doing business, which is why that expense of management threshold because will commissions come Commissions are not going to come down, right? All that I'm saying is you should look at the relative scale. Today, when I'm investing on employees who are joining on the roles of ISIS Lombard, that's a fixed cost to me. I don't have a denominator for it. Those employees of mine have to kind of get 15 to 20,000 agents on board first. Right now, we are at about 10,000 number. That's the number that we put out last time. So that's the number, 20,000 agents. 15 to 20,000 agents, at least they should add. That's 1,000 employees. Uh, plus, we are making investment this year as well. So they need to add 15 to 20. They need to start becoming productive. Today, none of them are there in the denominator. So automatically my expense ratio will start to look better. Today my expense ratios are adverse because my denominator is lower. So there is operating leverage in this business. Of course. Right? Of course there is an operating leverage in this business. And then your bargaining power with hospitals. And Which is a constant dialogue that we will do not just in health but even across lines of business. So 2x, 3x our size of right now retail health. So let me give a, I can only tell you over the years if you look at my headcount productivity number. Again we don't want to look at one or two years numbers. If you look at again 2008 to 2022. My headcount numbers would have dropped by roughly 40% from the peak in 2008 to where we are in 2022. My policy count would have increased almost about 8x. And therefore, consistently over a 14 year cycle, my headcount productivity is roughly about 15%. 15% annualized? 15% CAGR, yeah. year on year annualized. As, as a, as and a that continues even with these investments? This is over a 14 year cycle because each of these investments will start to play out over a point of time. Which is why if you look at it over a 2 year cycle, it Correct. will be a very, you will, exactly. you will show a very low number. But you have to look at it over cycles. That's the reason I gave it to you so, over so a little longer a, horizon. So, exactly. so over a 5, 10 year period? Over a 5, 10 year period, this, our objective will be to obviously try and see if we can maintain the headcount productivity. That's what we would largely want to try. Just uh, last, so with this motor, uh, you know, the sanctity in the pricing yeah, is coming your set. Yeah, yeah. So, so do you see that market share loss is getting cut uh, in? We can have it. Uh, you see this. So, one thing. If load to banana.